Where does our will come from? Is there meaning to living? Why was the world created? For fucking hot ass anime girls, that's why. <laughs> All right. We're, we're going to go there right away. Okay. How could we not? I was going to have a deep philosophical Ooh, meaning for to me. these questions. Uh-uh. We were going to discuss the mind palace, but you know, we'll just, yeah. Uh uh-uh. uh. Uh uh. Ooh, woo for me. That's why. Yeah. It's campaign comrades. We're here. <laughs> We're talking about near. Uh, Got to say it with the upward inflection to make sure I get the the uh, uppercase R into my word. Um, we're we're talking about one of my, this is my monthly game here, folks. This is my choice. I made everyone sit down and play one of my uwu anime games <laughs> that that might make you cry. We we've gone from things like Pokemon, very high level, high intelligence. <laughs> to, to near very very low level low level thinking uh not very much uh analysis thinking. that needs to go on what, what are you talking about man i was just slaughtering robots over and over again they kept telling me like kill the robots and i was like okay i kill the robots <laughs> i just kept um, going machines, up, and up. i just robots. kept going up and down ladders no reason no reasons <laughs> hey me too but i was playing replicant weird <laughs> <laughs> I was doing it on the 9S storyline. I mean, uh, in Replicant, your character is uh, starts out as a twink femboy boy. He like, yeah, he's like a 13, 15-year-old boy, yeah. A and brother. then becomes a twink femboy uh, man. <laughs> yeah. Or like, a... young adult. I'm a man! Who is fully legal. Barely legal. Hey, I'm they pretty said sure five years, and if he was yeah, thirteen, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. the math. I mean, also it, at that point in Japan, thirteen was legal, so still is. I, think, I thought it was fourteen. <laughs> um, whatever. Either way, I know it was low. Yeah, yeah. Good thing we don't Either know way. the exact age. We'll move <laughs> yeah. Anyways, we're gonna move on here. Um. I forced these these guys to sit down and play through. I gave them a choice. You know, near is two games. It's a spinoff of Drakengard. I didn't sit here and go play Drakengard, you fools. Because <laughs> uh, um, there are three dra- there are three Drakengard games, right? Correct. Depends or on is, who you ask. Because or, if you or, ask a Yoko Taro fan, there's only two. There's only two. But I I do prefer the uh, the Japanese title for it, Dragon Dragoon. Yeah. Oh. So good, so good, amazing. Way better. Yeah. I mean, blame uh, westernization, uh, localized text from the mid-2000s. There were some really bad localizations back then. I love me a good Dragoon. Uh, Speaking of Dragoons, quickly, Matt, did you fight the the Dragoon Knight yet in Final Fantasy XVI? No. I haven't uh, haven't had a chance to do past what I said I finished. I got a quick, quickly little thing. People are like, oh, it's not Final Fantasy. It's not my Final Fantasy. Just look at that still frame of when when the Dragoon Knight comes in and, you know, fuck out of here. (laughs) But just my little Dragoon tangent. Love Dragoon. Understandable, Wyvern. Uh, But this, um, what we're talking about is a, a series of games created by a man named Yoko Taro. Um, to me, one of the last great auteurs is the, the proper. One of the last great auteurs when it comes to video game creation and writing someone Absolutely. who creates with uh, and they, they talk about it a lot with his writing style where he writes backwards. He creates the ending first and then cre- writes the story from that ending and then maps out emotional beats and what emotions he wants his writer, uh, his users to feel at certain well, spots. When I was reading about that, I was all I was thinking about was did did Yoko Taro take uh, American graduate level uh, education courses? Because that's like the whole theory of lesson planning is like backwards uh, planning. And to me, I, I don't know why people don't think of that more often for just any sort of writing or storytelling man is an absolute chad for just being like yeah my fucking story beats make no fucking sense all i want is to make you feel i want to make you feel yeah. something 
and boy does he make you feel things and I, <laughs> man through this series i felt such a range of things uh ambivalence rage joy sadness horniness oh yeah <laughs> all n- never not horny throughout yeah. that was that Literally was the one constant simultaneously that was that was the one constant throughout the I, entire book. i don't know horny <laughs> sad horny ambivalent <laughs> There is a section where you're 9S as a chunky robot that the horniness levels, they drop pretty low there. I don't know, man. When I take over as that robot trying to save his brother, I feel a true love connection there. (laughs) As I trip over the smallest rivet in the floor (laughs) and dump my oil everywhere. Brother. Uh, I spilled so much oil. Man, I I, I didn't didn't trip once. I didn't trip once. I was was an oil delivery I was trying to jump. Yeah, me too. I was way too impatient with the movement. I was like, jump, bitch, jump. And then I was like, oh, the jumping is the ish. Well, it didn't take me that long to figure out the jumping was uh, the reason I was Yeah, I I, I spilled once from jumping and was like, oh, I have to do this the slow way. Got it. Um, But yeah, Yoko Taro is one of those people. uh, He's a lot of what he credits for what's framed his like writing style in the future comes from his early childhood uh born to a mother and father who you know in japanese culture were working their lives away you know corporate and he was not raised by them he was raised by his grandmother and he credits her for a lot of uh shaping how he felt and how he wanted to tell stories but he uh references one particular moment that really like twisted everything for him and it was this discussion around and the the exact happenings of this, I couldn't find a full, uh, like corroborated story of. But the general gist was he saw a man slip and fall, hit his head and die, at a very young age, and he was taken aback by the sadness but humor that you could find in a moment like that, because you know it looks silly when a person you know slips and falls. Like look at look uh, at no, this no. asshole, love Mao. Oh no, he's dead. That's <laughs> yeah. that's gr- that's gray matter spilling out. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you you really feel that sometimes with uh you know how he's writing these games and how he's putting them together. You know, you get that kind of like, oh, that's a really sad moment, but that was also kind of funny. And like, there's uh some some of these for me and like replicant would be like I'd be climbing a ladder during like a really emotional beat and just watching a meal just zoom back and forth across the screen because his character doesn't know what to do until i get to the next yeah, level yeah yeah the the companion ai when you're climbing up shit was a little wild love to watch kaine disappear into a wall uh-huh. <laughs> um but you know he he really embraces that dark storytelling when it comes to the type of story he wants to bring forward you know drakengard it's one of those, uh, I've never played Drakengard. I did a lot of research into Drakengard to make sure I understand understood what I was talking about here. Uh, someone is going to come at me and eventually be like, you didn't play Drakengard, you absolute nerd. You can't talk about it. Yeah, it's, it's their favorite game or whatever. But uh, he didn't initially plan on going into video games at all. That was a complete like uh, side effect of being a 3D animator uh, in CGI at the time. But he eventually got the where start. did he where did he work where did he work before taking on oh okay i see namco and sony got it yes as a 3d cgi artist uh did stuff for like alpine racer 2 and time crisis 2 uh Ooh. time crisis 2 in particular is a game that stands out to me because i remember that at the um movie theater arcade oh, in hell yeah. me too time me crisis too. is goaded I yeah, love all one time, of the goaded places. light gun games of our generation, and if I could ever find a functional cabinet in oh, my dream, yeah. oh my god, that, that would be that would be awesome. I I had the at home setup for the PS3. It worked for PS2 and PS3, and you had the light gun and you had sensors you put on the TV. It was awesome. It was very much the same experience. But did you have the foot pedal? No, there wasn't yeah, a foot pedal. It was a button. Nope. That's so the, the only the thing. Experience. <laughs> How dare you besmirch the full arcade cabinet experience? <laughs> um, you can thank Yoko Taro for a little bit of that. You know, a little bit of the three the three D work, a little little kiss. <laughs> um, 
he got his first video game actual work as a director at Cavia, Cavia, a company I'd never heard of until looking into this. Uh, their their catalog is basically just Dragon Guard and Near, and then like a couple Resident Evil games, like spinoffs, uh, Umbrella Chronicles and Dark Side Chronicles, which were DS titles, I believe. I was gonna say that. That sounds like a DS game. Anything with like Chronicles in it that's just going to be like storytelling was just made. Xenoblade for Chronicles screen. staring into the abyss, screaming. <laughs> it's the Chronic. What calls of Resident Evil? Um, but he, uh, he made Drakengard was his first uh, directed game that he's credited with, and he got he was actually incredibly fed up with the process of making games at the time because he was annoyed at how much uh, how many people were coming to him and telling him to change things um you know people who weren't making the game you know these were uh people who didn't have share Corporate his vision schmucks. who were trying who were trying to change what he you know he wanted to make and he didn't like that very much and ended up uh swearing off of video games and didn't want to direct anymore and that's why Drakengard 2 didn't have him as the director he only did a little bit of side work for the game uh, and that's why Yoko Taro fans, you know, consider Dragon Guard 2 non-canon because he didn't make it. It's not his story. It's not canon, bro. Fanfic. Yeah. I mean, that's how you know it's uh, for anime fans because that's a... We yeah, just get arguing that Arguing over canon. So, yeah. <laughs> the light novels aren't canon because he's never set, stated they are. Um, he came back... After Drakengard 2 and made near Gestalt slash Replicant. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are two versions so of the game. It was confusing to me. It was a bit, it was a bit it's very confusing simple. to me. But yeah. yeah, no, I figured it out now. But at first, I was like, what the fuck is going on? There's too many they, they names, looked, how many Replicants, how many Nears. They looked at the West and they were like, wow, they're not going to vibe with brother-sister storytelling. Uh, Sweet Home Alabama, by the way. Um, they're they're gonna vibe more with gritty dad and daughter. You know the the Joel and Ellie, the Papa Near. The, we Papa we do Nier. love that 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 like uh that theme. You know, uh, they they were ahead of their time. They they knew what what the Americans want. Um, Papa Near was a leather daddy. Yep, you can play as him in the uh the remake. Yeah, there's like the, a you can like you can like get like his, his outfit or something. Oh, you do play yeah. as him. Yeah, that's right. In the yeah. in the that bit of DLC. Yep, that was a cool little uh, like Easter egg, wink, wink, nudge, nudge that I enjoyed. Uh, but you know, I personally preferred the brother sister relationship. It felt more um, desolate <laughs> to have a, a brother and sister with no parents left, no like world to take care of them. Uh, so, so you're more, more you're more interested in the uh, stepsister stuck in the washing machine uh, <laughs> pornos rather than the stepdaughter. Okay, understood. I mean, if you if you want to go there, sure. But <laughs> that's not where I was going. Uh, I was more just saying the feeling that gets evoked from the the desperation. It feels yeah, my, different. My qu- my question is, how do they pay for the the rent, the mortgage on that house of theirs? They have like the only house in the entire village. They're they're doing the devil step and sister, step brother stuck in the washing machine pornos. Selling them <laughs> online. Canceled. Thirteen. How does years anyone old? afford? They're, they're, in they're, they're thirteen Biden's or something they're, like they're, that. They're sending that. They're sending them out in the magic mailbox uh, system <laughs> at yeah. play. In... <clears throat> but so he made uh, near replicant slash gestalt released in 2010. It was his second game after skipping Dragon Guard two as a director. Uh, it was really starting to emphasize the thing where he doesn't like to tell direct sequel stories. He'd much prefer his stories to be paced in a way that it is just so far down the line. The the lore can be legend instead of fact. Even with, yeah, even with the near games, right? They like that's that's almost, exactly what is, they almost like don't connect at all. <laughs> it's like there are the few characters that cross over, uh, you know, Devil and Popola, and that's Emil. basically it. Yeah, yeah Emil, Emil. and that's it. Um. 
but yeah, no, that's what he he prefers to tell stories that way because you don't you don't feel as restricted when you're telling a direct sequel because a direct sequel has to follow relatively speaking uh, where you left off or build on what you had already instead of starting a new uh, character system. And like that whole idea, even to me, feeds into his um, you know disdain for giving interviews. Um, oh man, I love that. Yeah, that's and, me with and, my and... webcam at work. <laughs> same uh and it, but you know it was interesting to me that he doesn't like to discuss the art essentially that he's making and it you know that leaves for him a freedom to then you know in the the next uh iteration of her the next uh installment um you know it, is free to tell the story the way he wants he's not restricted by the previous game or things that he said and it just allows the fans to you know have more freedom with what they think is going on in that world um and, and don't you know have to limit themselves to what the the artist what the director you know says it is and you know the forum communities that you know bow down to which there probably still are but you know uh without oh man the, the, the near the r slash near subreddit is quite quite the follow for anyone yeah, who uses I'm, reddit i'm sure it's a mixture of uh game theory existential just... philosophy horniness yeah fan exactly. art and cosplay yeah i mean the fan art and cosplay and the horniness go hand in hand like come on yeah i have definitely not watched a lady dressed as to be play a piano definitely not <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. But shor shortly after near replicant slash gestalt, uh, Cavia closed down as a studio, uh, shuttered its doors, didn't really have much going for it, sad to say. Um, and who else would swing through at the time and scoop up an artist from Japan, but Square Enix? You know, always, always circling the waters, looking for the next uh, fantasy writer they can add to their team. To eventually uh churn into a final fantasy clone um they came in and they were like hey i know you uh know you wish you could have done more with dragon guard we'll let you make dragon guard 3 you know you can finish dragon guard the way you want it to end instead of how they like forced a, a sequel on you and that's where you get the the connection between Drakengard and Nier. He adds that cutscene in Drakengard 3 that connects the greater universe of the two games together. There's an ending that involves um, it's a fight with a demon king or something like that. Uh, and the demon king falls through this portal into an alternate dimension along with a big dragon. And I believe that's your dragon. Uh, and you watch the Demon King die, and you're like, yeah, we won. And then the Japanese military, because it's Tokyo, Japan, 2003, comes in with uh, helicopters and launches uh, missiles upon the dragon and kill it because, you know, giant ass dragon just came out of the sky. We got to can't, can't have Godzilla for real. Um, and the killing yeah, no, of they, this. They've been prepared for years for that, that very thing. So they, they were ready. I mean, we we joke. North Korea launches a lot of missiles into the ocean. Pacific Rim think? is going to happen. Yeah. Okay, you're looking in the yes. wrong direction. Um, but the, the underworld the dragon... is real. <laughs> I want to believe. Uh, I can't wait till this dragon to and this demon unleash a plague right. on uh, 2003 Tokyo, Japan. This black uh, black disease that kills uh, most of humanity, which is it what has, kicks off. It has another name too, right? Um, black. White chlorination syndrome. Is that what it is? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> which like you only you only get like hints at in in replicant. Like you like if you get yep. like in like the data, the data pulls in like the the records when you like go under like the under Emil's house and see the laboratory stuff you get yeah you get like you have to look for it and it doesn't really explain a it's whole all lot. there but you have to get yeah well that's one of the things though about uh how he puts his games together is he's completely unabashedly unafraid to have people just not get not get shit 
you know he doesn't sit there and guide you like pull your hand over to all the lore pieces and be like no read this like l- learn about what i've uh put into the background uh he he puts multiple endings to create the full story of the game but he rolls credits after each one which for a lot of people yeah, they see so credits can... they go cool i'm, I'm done i'm, do- I'm, I'm done you you can miss the entire per- point of the game which like we'll get to when we get to automata but that's, that's something I appreciate is like, he's not afraid to let people miss things. It's something that a lot of games don't do anymore. You know, you know who does do it though? Our, our boy, our boy. Yeah, exactly. I was about to just say from, from is very similar. I think, uh, you know, kindred, kindred minds. Probably why I enjoy these games so much uh, is the, just how they tell a story is compelling to me. But he's um, he partners with Square Enix, you know they released Dragon Guard three, and then comes the this game when it launched, set aside it, it broke records for anything he'd launched at the time. It was far and away the best release they'd had. It was a partnership with Platinum Games, one of their best releases in my opinion. And Platinum Games has a history of really good games like Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, <laughs> um, one of the all time um, great titles true it's i mean people meme about it but it, you know the meme potential of that game is part staying power of why that game is so beloved um you platinum's done some incredible stuff uh the wonderful 101 is actually incredibly underrated as far as a complex combat system that platinum has put together uh but i'm talking about near automata which launched in 2017 a far a far future sequel to near replicant um way past anything that we did uh on the world uh, in replicant uh a future where humanity has you know been forced off the planet and is you know theoretically living on a moon base spoilers um and forcing androids to fight on their behalf in an eternal war for the glory of mankind glory to mankind so i want to point one thing out and then i have a question that I think is good for the audience. And I also don't fully understand it. Um, and I'm hoping we clear it up. One would like to note that Yogotaro is um, uh, an abolitionist because the time jump in Replicant is 1312 a cab. Um, then my question is what distinguishes uh, an Android from you know, a machine in this world. Androids just look like humans. That's literally androids were android created is. in the image of humanity and were given a, a drive for humanity. Yeah. And that's 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 not unique to to this u- universe. Androids are are yeah are 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 machines but are designed with the explicit uh you know purpose of of mimicking humanity one of the great examples that most people understand is uh the androids in dragon ball android 17 18 and 16 we don't talk about android 19 they're they're basically they are as close to human as you can get so they have no portion of humanity especially by the time of autonoma that they're like no part human in any way they just are ai machines they, they are, they are creating the image humanity. of humanity and they are given certain emotional aspect of the human mind there's yeah. sex there, there's some theory there is some theory that uh the androids are like have their the, the different models have their personalities based off of like memory data of specific humans and people have speculated with I think there's some evidence to back it up that um that two bees is derived from Kine from yes. from Replicant. That is a very popular fan theory, and I am here for it. Two B doesn't I, swear enough. I, I gotta say, I don't like Kine. I don't I was like there's so much I don't Fuck like you ab- book bitch ab- about <laughs> the about Replicant, and it's just like her character. I mean, I I think almost all their characterizations I find borderline repulsive um oh you don't like emil <laughs> oh no i i i seriously dislike the voice actor for emil it it makes me physically cringe uh the, the fight, like the fight with wendy 
the fight with Wendy when he goes uh super mega ultra weapon mode uh-huh, uh-huh. and is just screaming with right. the beam attack. Yeah, something no, his, it's something like is horrifying, very epic, and it's just very like uh comical to me. Yeah, <laughs> I love him. Haunting the yeah. face is haunting. I mean, that's a uh, spoilers, that's his sister's face, mm. but then they like you, they get you, they get you combined, get, they get combined and conjoined. You ever, uh, you ever get made in a lab to be an ultimate magical weapon with your uh sister? And then end up fusing together to make the ultimate, ultimate magical weapon. <laughs> Every day. But then in the sequel, just drives around and uh, well. rides you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all he does, sure. Yeah. Um, spoiler, I... hard, hardest boss in the game. Yeah. <laughs> even, even harder than the Square Enix CEO, which is my favorite part of that game. <laughs> Yeah, you you can fight the square and platinum CEOs together in a tag yeah. team fight. Very funny. That's in fantastic. A, in, in an arena fight, are they like Adam and Eve type machines, or are they um, uh, androids? Androids. I mean, I they're mostly it, just an Easter egg. Yeah, they don't really they don't really get go into it. It's just a funny little bit. Yeah, <laughs> they're they're the final round of the arena, and they jump in. But, uh, yeah, no, near, near Automata really put the, the series on the map in a way that none of the other games had at the time. It, it breached the barrier and made its way to Xbox. One oh, of the baby. very few, yeah. like one, one, of few, very one of the few, few square games to, yeah. to, you know, that they would deign to let them go onto a, uh, inferior platform. Well, and the, the funny part I always like to point out because Xbox fans always get mad. They're like, Square Enix doesn't release games for Xbox. They're basically Sony exclusive. And it's like, well, the games they've released for you, you don't really buy. It's like, if you look at the breakdowns, like Nier Automata sold its worst in percentage and total sales on Xbox compared to all its other platforms, including oh. Switch, PS4, oh. and PC. Uh, I mean, it's kind of a part the of the, don't part have of the demographic Xboxes. breakdown is that Xbox doesn't really exist in uh, Japan or most of the Asian uh, market. No, it, so is, a, a, it, is, it is almost exclusively a Western. Yeah. Is, there's just, Generally there's a, speaking, there's a Western, just there's, America. And yeah, there's like, a cursed Western okay. ethos uh, that goes into being an Xbox, an Xbox, in part of the Xbox ecosystem. <laughs> but yeah, the Nier, Nier Automata made its way onto Game Pass. That was a like a big deal at the time for Xbox users because they were finally able to experience some of this, uh, you know, different storytelling and like get Horniness. get a taste of what what you can get on the other side. Boy, howdy! If you want to play these games, you have to go to the other side. You're not playing them on Xbox, that's for sure. Uh, Nier Automata did so well. They were able to revive and remake remaster. It's a little bit of both. I know we've had an episode breaking down the distinctions of it. And this, this game, one definitely Europe... straddles that line, right? Because yeah. because yeah. because four fifths of it are are a remaster, but then the fifth ending is completely new. Completely new. A pit, which apparently a had only been a remake a novel. aspect in the combat because platinum sure. helped reshape some of the combat initially. But apparently the, because... the the final true ending of ending E from Replicant had been like a Did novel. not exist in the first game. Yeah, well, oh, it yes. didn't exist in the first game. It had just been done in a novel form, and people were, like, so happy to see it brought into its original medium. But, like, they, that's just, like, a, also, a, a It's also the touch. ultimate Square game because of the naming convention. I mean, who doesn't love near Replicant version 1.22474487139 dot dot dot? Because what is it supposed to be? It's the square root of of two or something, or yeah, yeah is that what it is? Yeah, because it's like not a sequel but kind of a sequel. So I noticed that they changed like some of the time jumps in the remake remastered of Replicant. Was there any particular reasoning for that, or just do we know? No. I couldn't tell you if I'm completely yeah. honest. So, like, they change it. I don't know if it goes from 1312 in the original to 1412, 
uh, or vice versa in the time jump. Um, and then there was also something with the age, I believe, of of the boy. Um, that, I assume, is just catering towards a Western audience that doesn't like 13-year-olds uh, as their protagonists. I mean, I was definitely done with a boy protagonist by the time his arc was over. Uh, his stupid little rat tail ponytail thing really bothered me. me. For me, it was the, the it, was his, it was his weird like overall tunic garb that really just looked so fucking weird to me. That was the yeah, big thing with his character design for me. T- talk about a glow up, though. Oh my god, hell yeah! Um, Matt, how how far did you end up getting in in Replicant? I got ending A and B. Okay, just, and then I thought about it. ending C Budget. yesterday, and then put Final Fantasy 16 in my <laughs> It was I wasn't in control of my body. I don't know what happened. Uh, things were moving on their own. Absolutely, I totally I do, get it. I do fully intend to go back and finish Near Replicant, though, because I don't like leaving it at a state that is not right. relatively complete. I've already conceded I can't platinum the game because there's just aspects to the platinum trophy that are. <laughs> things that i don't enjoy to do like complete the game in 15 hours that means i have to start a, a brand new file and s- just speed run the story does that mean finish all five endings in 15 hours mm-hmm. oh I, I, I don't know how i don't know how you do that because like again with with getting you ha- all you have to legitimately skip every cutscene mainline just to the story bits don't fight anything just jump over like avoid anything that isn't the boss it is possible but i do not care no. to do that <laughs> no because again with the whole thing about being able to unlock the third ending you've got to get all the fucking weapons that means you got to do a certain number of side quests and get enough gold oh boy, to some buy of the weapons are and... not fucking fun let me tell you i would say none of them are fun um <laughs> I I do not recall having a good time with any of the quests in in Replicant. I didn't. There were some that were okay. Like I the, didn't mind the some lighthouse of the, the lady was kind of lighthouse. yeah, it was kind of yeah. interesting. The me- mechanic wise sucked. Even that was boring, <laughs> shitty, yeah. nothing interesting. But like the the and the like story Devil and Popola it, singing was fun. Yeah, I just sat there and let it play for a little bit. Yeah, same. Just chilled for a bit. A little personal concert. And then remembered that memory in the back of my head as I was brutally slaughtering them later on. Uh, to wrap out his his run up with Square Enix before we can just openly talk uh, about everything. He has, the final three games he's done there are the voice of cards games. If you remember. Which I didn't know games. that at all. I did not. I did not know that at all. Uh, neither did I. I was kind of shocked when I saw that under his accreditation. I don't um, even know what that are, is. They are card based, like story RPGs. They're not the really. They're I... not really like deck builders, even though they have no. cards. But it's like everything is done through these cards. It's it's kind of interesting, but kind of also not at the same time. They, they've they've all been like middlingly received. Um, the recent ones were were done were received relatively well. Yes, from what I understand, so there's three of them: uh, Isle, the Isle Dragon Roars, the Forsaken Maiden, and the Beasts of Burden. Okay, something that I've always had on a wish list that just never drops to a price low enough for me to invest in. Yeah, maybe I'll take I'll take another look at those, knowing that knowing that he's involved. Just that makes me think thought. of Yu Gi Oh, the Heart of the Cards. All right, so we can now just more broadly focus on our experiences with the games that we've played to this point, because I've broken into, you know, I've talked about how Drakengard, you know, over overarchingly connects to the series. I can bring up the uh, the connection and the fact that, you know, Automata is just, you know, well in the future of the events of Near Replicant on the same. Like 10,000 years. Yeah, to, to, again, to the point years. where lore is now legend and uh nothing can truly be like locked down except for emile's immortal head uh 
floating around doing its thing playing some uh, absolutely bombastic music uh through some emotional cutscenes. i had one where i was in like i don't remember exactly which cutscene it was in the middle of the city but emil just came fucking barreling through (laughs) 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 i was sitting there was like it's cool to know the world is like live live living around me as i'm doing this shit uh but it's a little yeah. immersion breaking to, I mean, I mean, although hear that goes, Emil's music. Yeah, but that goes a little bit to, you know, the dark humor of, uh, yeah, for yeah. sure, of Yoko Taro. So that's, that's, that's still in character. Um, but yeah, Matt, you and I are the only ones who played any Replicant. And, yes. um, man, I actually um, enjoyed Replicant by the end of my uh, ending B. I, I was, like turned around on it on my second playthrough. I mean, yeah, ending B had more interesting stuff because you're actually get, it's you know starting to subvert. I mean, I I sent you the what's meme going on of the like the the shade comforting the 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 babies. Yeah, yeah, you're just you're <laughs> you're killing baby souls is literally what you're doing. But it's <laughs> it's literally are we the baddies? The game is is what it is. Yeah. It's you as you continue each playthrough, you you know realizing that you know you are the bad guy, uh, or at least probably the worst guy. Um, who's the yes. bad guy that yeah. like you know the the shadow lord or whatever is the 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 original gestalt the the separated soul of that original the original near brothers yes. um you know was the basis of of project gestalt um you know he's trying to save humanity they're trying to yep. They're like the only way to solve the issue of the the black scrawl, the white chlorination syndrome, is to separate souls from bodies, and bodies are reproduced through these replicant things that like are themselves sterile and incapable of reproduction, and um, that you know the the hope is that eventually that's never quite fully explained what the deal with the two tomes grimoire noir and grimoire vice that like by them merging together is what will cure yeah, there purge was, purge the there was world a beautiful the... uh there was a beautiful discussion on the near subreddit about this where it's like grimoire noir could have ended this all if he just wasn't a creepy fuck yeah in the in the first uh confrontation because he's just being super like cryptic about everything and he's like no you must merge with me vice and we will destroy the 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 world and bring back and just like all this cryptic shit that doesn't and if he just came forward and was like hey man you and me we combine none of this matters anymore it's all done it's all fixed but so it's like what you what you learn as you go into ending b is like you're you all these like literally like faceless and kind of formless enemies that you've been fighting just you know mindlessly slaughtering the whole time are you know human souls that are are more human than you are and yep. you know have more emotions more feelings and you, you can finally understand their speech it's like you can yeah. understand their speech so it's like you get you're getting their points of view so this type of thing is will ring some bells for you two who have played automata that like through the different playthroughs you're getting more perspective on it and that's obviously the most interesting part of replicant that is one 100 most interesting part but it is the rest the actual course of the game and the gameplay and the subsequent playthroughs is so fucking rote that honestly just like i i couldn't do it anymore i yeah, I I I plowed through ending B in like four hours. Like it was really quick, but like I couldn't do that again. I I couldn't go through that part again. To then something I did that made it, improved it for me a lot was I didn't fight a single enemy that wasn't in a boss fight. Right, right. No, like same. No, same. Same. I just ran directly to every boss fight um it was the i was also doing that emotionally because i was like i can't keep killing all of these people and like i don't deal with the fact that i'm going into boss fights and witnessing like the the bosses like uh gretel gretel for example it is you know is a broken uh soul who's lost her brother and these shades are comforting her in a way you know and she's pushing them off like oh you're you're abominations you shouldn't uh, you have no business talking to me and you know you get to see that relationship form with them so that when you enter that boss fight and she summons shades to fight with 
uh, and you're killing them, she's getting mad at you and calling out the fact that you're killing her friends. And you're, she's not there to defend, like, uh, in the same way that before, like, you were trying to steal Grimoire Vice from them. She's there protecting the shades who comforted her in a time of need that you've been slaughtering to get yeah, to her. So, so there are these interesting ideas and all these things. And like, as the endings progress, cause I watched all the other ones online afterwards, just cause I was supposed yeah. to put the time in. Um, cause knowing that I wanted to, I, I wanted to see ending E because that's the, that's the one that is the, the most, the most different. And it is mechanically, it is mechanically different. Um, but like what I came down, what I came to realize is, um, as I'm watching that ending and seeing the the culmination of like the the near kind a Emil storyline is just like I don't fucking care about these characters. I mean, um, you're not really supposed to care about the near you're playing as. He's kind of an asshole. It's just like, uh, and I don't. I say I didn't like kind either. The only character that I actually kind of enjoyed was Grimoire Vice because uh, absolutely god tier voice performance ripping by, off the page by by liam o'brien um you know just absolutely chewing the the shit out of, out of oh those, man that uh, in the ending script. when he turns back and he's like uh because near calls him vice and he's like remember what i said about using my full name and he's like but weiss has grown on me so it's fine or it's something just, like that. I don't know. I just like I, I like I found myself deeply not caring about this game. And it was just so much fucking mechanical drudgery that was just like I can't fucking deal with it. Like I had run around these environments for so fucking long, even doing straight shots on subsequent ones, too much. Couldn't do it. But you know what was really got me? What really got me? It would have been redoing the the uh the keystone fragment up in the machine area um or up not up in the um like the uh mythical forest no that's the text adventure the um the one with the where, where the the brothers shop is the yeah the junk heap the junk heap yeah um in order to progress that thing you've got to go down get a part come back and then go back down again do you, you want to know say secret? my first my first playthrough is i had banked an i had had an extra one in my inventory so i didn't need to do that but then for the third playthrough i didn't have any more so i would have had to do it again and i was just like nope nope not doing it not gonna do it not gonna do it not gonna do it i looked in my inventory and i had 10 of those sitting in my inventory for I did my not. first playthrough i did not i only had i only had like two because on my first playthrough, I went through and explored every area and every room and killed every enemy. Oh, so did I. Because... That's, but that was like, that's the area where you need to get all your drops from for, for weapon yes, upgrades. upgrades. And the drop rate was fucking abysmal. And I, I mean, I, I was cleared, telling, I was I cleared telling every Mike, room multiple times and got nothing. Got like maybe two things of titanium alloy, and which is what I you was need telling to Mike that uh, I wanted to upgrade my Phoenix Spear to level three because I'd nope. been on level two. Nope. And I, the only thing I was missing was a broken wristwatch. And I ran through the area where the enemies who drop that spawn, uh, which isn't in the, the junk heap, it's uh, the southern plains in between seafront. It was the big guys with the shields. Yeah. And I ran through there like 15 or so times and didn't get a single drop. And I was like, okay, whatever. I'm just going to move on. And then on the last run up to the final boss, because those enemies spawn in the ballroom, if you remember correctly, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I got like eight of them. And I was like, oh, gee, thanks. I can now upgrade this in my third playthrough if I want to. But uh, it would have been nice if I could have done it now. But you don't need to. You don't need to. No, Phoenix I mean, Spears Phoenix Spear is broken as shit. Already. But like, yeah, it's just like, I like, so, you know, we don't care, you know, about. We, we should, I was going to say we should move to Automata because that's. Well, the I was going to say like the the last one has yeah played. the last thing that you, you know that that comes here is that like in the the major endings you have to basically kill Kine kill Kine or kill yourself, um, yep. and then the uh, which has an interesting mechanic that we'll get to that we'll get to at the end that like is you know these there were these there are these glimmers of interesting ideas in replicant that were not given their full potential until automata they were they were seen to their 
they're... I think they were mechanically limited at the time sure. by the hardware as well. Like the, but it was like one the of idea, those things. Like the idea of giving up your save. It was like you had to give up to kill yourself. You had to give up your save file in order to say it is kind of quote unquote give up your save file to save Kine. Then you do your ending E where you're playing as Kine and she like is plagued by these ghosts of memories about your character and is eventually yeah. she she regains it and rebirths uh the the main character and your saves are brought back and uh it's like everybody is like rebirthed in this giant lunar tier and it's just like okay that's interesting but again i don't fucking care about these characters so let's fucking move on i know. would say fuck you too book bitch yeah, I just oh my god, I really I I really despise. Hey man, the... Laura Bailey, they just they locked her in a booth and said, "We need you to swear as much as you normally do." But it's just like, like be yourself. I'm not one who says like that. Oh, uh, swearing is a sign of like you know lack of intelligence. But like this was just like dumb cursing, like oh you fuckwit shit mouth piece of piece of ass. Like it literally sounded like that, and it's just like. The most brain dead fucking dialogue I've ever heard. As people from uh, a state in the Northeast, swearing is an art form. It's part of our language. It's yes. built in flavor savers. But we'll move on to Automata because that's the one that everyone here has touched on and played. And that'll be the it one we end on voice in discussion. Acting. Automata does have good voice acting. Um, there's so much about Automata that I, uh, you can see the bones of in Replicant that get just fleshed out completely in Automata. Um, it's much more mechanically sound. I think that's just a product of Square Enix and Platinum uh, pairing up and you know put, pouring their heart and soul into a game and probably working a couple developers, uh, you know, two or three times as much as they should. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like, like we we started this off saying that right. That- Yogo Taro is undeniably an auteur, right? And like that these games are a unique production of an of a of a unique mind. But you know, the success of Automata cannot be laid directly at his feet. You know, it is it is a team effort. Like, you know, without the the polish of the of the platinum um uh, combat, I don't necessarily know that it would have been as successful. If if this if Automata had old replicant slash gestalt combat it wouldn't have hit because the, it's the, the way that games, the way the differences in the combat moved together and yeah and and mirrored the tonal uh the tonal shifting and metamorphosis that the game itself has you undergo as you're moving through the different playthroughs like the moving from you know your hack and slash to your your 2D, your 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 2D side scroller to your uh bullet hell uh you know different you got, you types got twin stick hack- shooters, you got yeah. shoot 'em ups, you got yeah uh, yeah there's arcade he, games he really just puts everything in there. Text adventures in there yeah, too. The text adventure, yeah, which was also a part of Replicant. It's one of the things I enjoy is the the constantly shifting gameplay loop and uh, perspective that you get on your game. It's like when you're in the abandoned temple and replicant, it's really cool when you get that, like you walk out the back of the room and it turns to 2d platforming down the, the, the blocks through the sand. Like I always enjoy those quick shifts to a different type of gameplay just to like change up the loop and automata does that in spades. Yeah. Like and- the, the shift to Pascal's, like walking along the um oh, in the village in the village in like the village on like the wooden bridges like yeah. turning to the side scrolling even in the perspective in uh when you're a robot as 9s and you're you have to unlock the things for uh to be and yeah. you're like you know yeah, it they, zooms out they do, they some, they do of some of the that... most of the most extensive perspective changes in the factory and var- yeah. at various times one, one of my favorites is during the um the boss fight with the the thespian i don't remember her name simone. but the the amusement uh, park simone, yeah, simone. yeah yes which i have um, i have and there lots comes of a thoughts point, about some of these about some of these references th- there comes a point where she's begging you to look at her yeah and that's... you cannot Pivot right. your camera to right. can, I, yeah. can we can we can we dive into that because that is one of the one of the major things that Yoko Taro is doing in Automata is 
is analyzing and yeah, it seems on the surface that's just references to all these different major Western philosophers. Cause we joked about it, it's like, yeah, this is this game is all about, you know, like existentialism. And he, and he is looking at that, but he is largely critiquing existentialist philosophy and flipping it on its head. And so the character of Simone is representative of um the I believe she was French. Um yes. French philosopher Simone French philosopher. So, Simone de Beauvoir who was a uh, second wave feminist scholar who was also a uh you know had a personal relate personal and professional relationship with John Paul Sartre which is which we get in the reveal in yes in in part 2 is that like her character and her her devolution into this beauty obsessed thing comes from her relationship with the 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 shitty robot philosopher jean paul um mm -hmm. who we can so who you meet you yeah so yeah so simone simone de beauvoir she created the idea of the male gaze um and so that like is asserts that uh specific you know she's is is arguing that all gender is you know a socially performed construct um but like you know specifically talking about no feminine. it's not it's biology <laughs> It's like the, the femininity is a process that is, you know, pro is performed through this progression of norms and expectations that is laid upon uh, by society through that gaze that that there is no actual distinction between the male and female. It only arises out of in this the is in the case of how the male perceives femininity and what expectations it places upon it. So she is like. She was like a you know a regular machine life form, the Simone, and she fell in love with the existentialist philosophy spouting uh, Jean Paul, um, and uh, he is you know as we see in his quest line, he is completely self centered, which is again itself a a major critique of existentialist philosophy. That uh, existentialism, the idea that Sartre is most known for, is the existence preceding essence idea that all we know to be true is our own existence is this like super hyper individualist idea that like everything else basically everybody else in the world is just an npc the only thing <laughs> that exists is just you that's you and your rationality that's it that's the only thing that can perceive and produce meaning and he is the 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 robot jean paul is a satire of this because he is so self-absorbed does not see the impact his his actions have on these these female followers of his including simone who tries to perform femininity femininity by becoming beautiful so that he will look at her but he has no interest whatsoever um and then just yeah, an npc she, so it's like that bit in her boss fight where the camera control is ripped away from you she is performing that femininity, but yet you you are unable yeah. to look upon it. it. Is just a really kind of uh, very cool and subtle way to to kind of deconstruct these ideas. And I just I, I just love how Two B and Nine S show open contempt for Jean Paul. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is really really good. that they do. But there are a whole bunch of other, you know, philosophers, theories, and stuff that are. Oh yeah, are, I mean, even Pascal, like Pascal references yeah. uh, his, his openly. Plays. She's reading the book. Um, Hensies. By, uh, yeah, she's she she's is the book actually, by her is reading right. the book by Pascal, yeah. and it's the yeah the whole the whole idea of the yeah Pascal's wager, the which is the the bit about you know our he teaches the children the concept of fear which eventually results they in kill them all committing suicide yeah, sad. and sad. just yeah the, oh boy the idea that living in fear is no way to live because so it's the idea is pascal's wager for those who don't know it's so many of these philosophers like early modern philosophers are basically theologians as well and they are this this one is arguing about the existence of god and the wager that's placed is basically comes down to we should believe in god because we're placing a wager here and to basically the only thing that it's it's basically it's, it's just bad you should be afraid to to not believe in god because if you believe in god and god one doesn't exist nothing happens if god if god does exist good things happen if you don't believe in god 
and God doesn't exist, nothing happens. But if you don't believe in God and God does exist, you're fucked. So mm. it's about basically Oops. about just being afraid is that you should, you should. No, nah, man, that's just mitigating fear. damages. That's just, that's how <laughs> a lawyer thinks. You're limiting liability, mitigating damages. You know, that I would advise anyone here to, it's not legal advice, it's just theological advice, to believe in God in case, you know, it, he's real and shit happens. Isn't that off chance? Pascal yeah. is low key one of the best characters. I mean, yeah. honestly, all the characters are pretty damn good, uh, especially the antagonists. If I take played, really eat. if I had played Replicant before Automata and I had seen Devil in Popola, I would have been the like exclamation that, point that sound from Metal Gear Solid. <laughs> that was me. Ding. Like, yeah, immediately distrustful of Devil in Popola. Um, I don't think like, I'll ever trust twins ever again. But mm -hmm. they are these. These are you know you're led to believe that these are not the same models. Uh, they are like a different model. They are they, yeah, are, they got different you know, haircuts. They are the same model type, but they are not the ones that were responsible basically for ending the world, um, for failing in their mission. But like you know they are all the androids distrust them and hate them and blame them for the state of because they got red they, hair. <laughs> they they make it ambiguous at one point kind of there's like a, a dialogue between uh i think it's a2 and uh the twins or no it's 9s when he wakes up um from his two-week rest and they're saying you know describing what they who they are and how you know their model destroyed the world um but then they discuss like atoning for their own sins um you know, so like changing uh the like the the subject in that uh that sentence or you know that that dialogue to kind of make it ambiguous of whether they are the actual model or not never my, trust them my my main my main uh interest is you know asking the group is like what do you what do you guys feel like the 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 message of this game is what is yoko taro trying to do with this with this game like what is like because what i find most interesting is that he is less interested in again a story and is more interested in what this what what he is doing to you via interacting with this game how he radicalized you Can you pose your question that. again because I, I forgot in the intervening time. <laughs> it's just like what what do you think that the the major message that he's trying to get here was? Because there's what was he trying to make you feel? Because there's an interesting point where he you know, coming from this the opening, uh the opening of the game, you you feel like for anybody who has like, you know, played JRPGs, right? You Oh man, I'm you, gonna kill God. It's like you <laughs> yeah, you you think you know what you're in for. Right, that th that this is going to be, this this is going to be an existentialist experiment on what it means to be on on can these these uh can these non human entities achieve humanity and what does that mean for what we it means to be human gods yeah can can you say yeah can't you that you're out here to kill God but say like, the spoilers is you know sorry can't kill God God is already dead he's gone. God's gone. I mean, I think and sec secondary spoiler, you don't get to know God's dead because you need to maintain a status quo and God is kind of key in that uh, that cog. Yeah, you need that you need that uh, that all knowing threat. Uh, but you need I, a I purpose don't know. and the humans <laughs> give the androids purpose. Exactly. And I think that for me, my takeaway is like our interconnectedness and sense of community and caring for one another is what makes us human. I, I think that's kind of what I take away from this game. Like they, they through your different playthroughs, the your um, I'm 
now blanking on their name. Um, what are they called? The freaking robots that are not robots. Um, the androids or the machines? Yeah, yeah, androids. The, androids. The, no, the, the androids slow, like through each playthrough and, and through the progressing of each playthrough, the androids become more and more invested in each other. And I think that's that's the message. Well, it's machines. even something it's exactly. something that's and the machines. Out, um initially you you know you told of this war and this ravaging uh, war that's been waged and you drop down on the planet and there's no sign of this brutal oh. conflict that's been laid out you know a majority it's not played of, out that same a majority way. Of, the, uh, of the of the machines that you come across are docile yeah yeah there's, there's uh, ruins of a past war for sure but you know nothing active yeah you, but you, was you it even a war what is this called the 14th the 14th machine war your, huh? yeah yeah like so you, so there's there's this interesting thing where it's like it makes you think that yeah he's he's looking at uh these about the androids and the and the machines becoming more human but the but the androids are you know are deserting their posts falling in love um doing all these things that the machines are trying to evolve that they are they're trying to develop human culture they're trying Separ to separating themselves from the network is like that they know that they're stagnating and that they undertake these experiments to you know to Man, learn and hopefully King. evolve even though that they know that they're doomed they still try anyways they know that they're doomed to repeat these cycles yet they still try to try to anyways but where the real kind of kicker comes in is that Yogotaro is not actually interested in interrogating what's going on with the androids or the machines he is asking can you be human can you yeah. can can you show humanity and it comes through with that Roy with says. like what you're what you're talking about andrew is like the 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 commitment to to one another the can you can you show this form of compassion that is what it means to to truly be human to find meaning in a meaningless would you world help someone who wouldn't know only comes only comes yes from from putting yourself on the line and and connecting with another person that that is where true meaning comes from being it's, vulnerable and it's like so there is like the the it's the 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 kind of bookends of the of the game from the very beginning when you're setting up to the very ending of ending e where it's like you've got those questions that matt uh read for us at the beginning posed to the group um and it's as you're as you go through those answers in the beginning you're basically pushed in a way to respond in a very pessimistic and negative way to say that it is meaningless there is it is nothing that is that is what's driving everything but then as you get into this final sequence, after you've you've killed each other as A2 and, and 9S, um, as you lay bleeding out and the cycle seems like it's doomed to repeat itself, you you literally do get the, the chance to kill God as you are fighting the in in blowing up the you know the those who designed Credits. this game. Like you get to kill Yoko Taro. <laughs> um it's it, it is as you keep dying because it's so fucking difficult they keep ask, posing this other set of questions that in order to keep going you have to then completely go the opposite direction of what the the original questions it is asking you is it all pointless you have to say no do you think games are silly little things you have to say no do you admit that there is no meaning to this world you have to say no you have to you have to keep making the you have to keep uh asserting that no that that despite all the evidence to the contrary that there is the possibility for change there is a possibility for something more um and it's only once you have made that commitment that you get this you you get this offer for help and as these questions are coming up you get these messages from real people in the world and I, so like the one that i got that like that like really kind of just like fucked me up and like really um sent this home for me was getting the message that like um it was it was along the lines of because you're going from kind of like pre-canned statements that you can kind of construct yeah. your own thing um the whole dog yeah so but it was <laughs> like it was like um you and i have walked the same path so all i know is that you're not alone 
that like we're in this together and when that happens the music swells and matt you gotta you gotta like at least close this out in today's discussion with that the that end credit music as it was originally just one voice that is is moving through these different languages um but then a whole chorus comes in including the game's production staff yoko taro himself um and it just swells in this way and you are joined by this this group of individuals and you're finally able to beat the game the the final option you're given is do you make the ultimate sacrifice delete your save files and be able to help somebody else in the in the real world even and if so, they would never know even if they even if it's somebody you hated or who hated yep. you um and this is like where the idea was present in replicant but it's so much more powerful in 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 automata where it's like you have to give up your save file to save kine but she's a fucking MP, uh, computer generated npc that I, again i don't fucking care about for this you're doing it <laughs> you're doing it for a real person you're doing it for yeah. somebody that's really out there and it's just it hammers home the idea that you know life is more than pain and meaninglessness that we can kind of transform this struggle and find meaning and solidarity and kindness with our fellow human beings. And it's just like, I have not seen a game try to such a unique ending and idea that and it's something any that other game could do that. And it's something that could only come in this, in this way that Yoko Taro has formatted it. Right. And it's like that this game became such a truly unique experience. Like unlike any other game I have, I have I've, I've ever seen and it and only we're only comes... talking about five canon endings not the 21 additional little joke endings uh, yeah, joke yeah. endings yeah which is just such a neat little thing to add for people like me who must get everything well and I think those joke endings are like you said those some of those point to his finding humor in like dark things like the oh you die about tutorial you die boss. yeah it's, it's funny yeah like Sad, the game's funny. over. He died. But no, I think this game nails that messaging in just it's it's beautiful and 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 perfect and um well just like the the part where Pod I think it's o four three and one five two at the end it might be yeah. one five three and o four two I think it's like one five the, it's the ladder one, four two or something yeah yeah, yeah. um so one five three o four two just the denying over and over again the the sequence of restarting and just refusing it's like that that is part of the play of like automata is a real word it is the plural of automaton i learned that Mm -hmm. uh and an automaton is a self-operating machine and what you get from that pod denying is you get their first instance of self-operation where right. they're not just continuing a cycle, right? Because the, the maintaining a status quo, they are the, the real finally final, operating independently. Like the real final boss of the game is this um, singular artificial intelligence that is directing both sides, androids yep. and and machines. That's perpetuating because they this, need a purpose. This, yeah, it's unquote. perpetuating this cycle of violence. You know, two B nine S A two, they're all dead. Um, it takes those pods yet to gain some level of consciousness through and it's through their shared experience. It was through their breaking protocol and sharing their different interpretations and their views on things with one another. You would get those scenes where they're talking to one another just with a black backdrop. And it's through that sharing of data that they gain some level of sentience that they question their programming and uh, whether or not to start the cycle of conflict all over again, and instead, they elect to recreate the three androids and give them a second chance. Even if they might make the same choices, there's always the chance that they won't. And like, that's their it, choice to make. Yeah, and that's that's what like I've seen like a bit of commentary on um on the game that like a singular line that stuck with me that like truly answers what is this game about? It is the story about the joy of being alive. And what it means to be alive. One thing I liked about like incorporating this theme into the game is it, it wasn't uh, ham fisted really in any way, mm-hmm. <clears throat> especially with how the protagonists are 
you know, the gameplay is broken up. Um, it's not holding like your the, hand. It's not holding your hand. You have to engage with it on your own. Exactly. And like the little bits that are like holding your hand that are needed to be there to like, you know, even give you the clues to progress that way um, or, or, you know, for your character to develop in that way are just like uh, very engaging and, and interesting. And like you're still kind of finding it on your own rather than it just, again, slamming it in your face, um, you know, like uh, uh, an SJW blue haired uh westerner might hey man i learned at work yesterday that sjw is a classification of extension cable <laughs> i thought you're gonna say it's a slur nope that too, <laughs> SJW. That too. The, 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 w, too. Yeah. the w makes it weather rated so there's your there's your little bit of yeah. helpful uh technical advice tips. um I do like the, how the first the, boss you fight is Marks and Angles. It's very yes. funny. Yeah. <laughs> There's Hegel at one point. Hegel uh, Hegel but... is is the actual like so Matt was saying, you know, uh Emil is the hardest boss of the game. He is because he's a harder version of Hegel. Who Hegel yep. for me was the toughest boss in the game. You're just I was just, that's where I died the most as A2 is just like cuz you like I couldn't track all the fucking orbs and yeah and all that <laughs> shit and... losing so much uh hp when you're in berserk mode too well so that's the yeah it's the whole point it's like you 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 go down it's like it's their version uh, it's her version of the and it's like yeah it's like i hadn't quite understood how berserk mode worked at that point so it's like it it purposefully it brings you down to one hp but like you get a bunch of damage from it and then you just got to heal it's up red tear stone ring from dark souls yeah it's yeah. uh but like that i died i think i died twice to to hegel before i finally beat it like out of pure luck just dodging all <laughs> just dodging everything i was just healing i was a heal machine because i Wait, didn't absolutely. understand it and then I actually beat it. what one of the things i want to praise about this game in general and it's something that i can actually tie to fan final fantasy 16 as well ironically enough um is how this <laughs> ironically <game> handles, <laughs> yeah. is how this game handles its easy mode because easy mode does not arbitrarily it. change health values it doesn't change damage numbers the the creatures stay what they are it just adds those automatic accessories that automate you know dodging or pod pod programs yeah things that you don't have to think about while you're do, uh, focusing on some other parts of the combat and the nice thing about that is their accessories. You can get to a point where you can be like, okay, I finally get the flow of the melee combat down. Maybe I can add the pod in as well while the dodging is still automatic and you can remove the automated pod accessory. Favorite pod programs. Um, Favorite pod programs. What did we get? What do we got? Oh, I was on easy mode. So the equipment like customization, it was just giving me the, the automatic. For me, it was, for me, it was uh, it was the hammer. I loved me. I loved me. I loved to make the hammer oh, go. Bonk. Oh, 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 oh the yeah, what they shot. Thing. I thought you were yeah. thinking. The, I thought you were talking about like the chips. I was. No. I loved the fucking laser beam. Yeah, I, was I, laser I rocked beam. the laser the whole time. It was good. It, there, there, was certain, there were certain bosses where you needed to put the laser on. Yeah. Yes. Um, but uh, I also like. I mean, Ben, blade. you even saw me yeah. in Replicant. You're like, you're just using the pod program. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah, yeah. God yeah. damn right, I am. There, no, there's a spell. There's a spell. You know, you know, so the the normal pod shooting for Automata. There's a spell in in Replicant that is a sec effectively the exact same thing. Um, and you know how their comparison. You can put a skin on your pod in Automata that just yeah, turns him into Grimoire Vice. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh but uh the only thing is like yeah it's not the same and why i never used that spell in replicant is because you have an mp it pool burns magic it, it absolutely just burns through your magic and so it's holding that down like you would in in automata just like you're just burning through magic so it's yeah. it's not effective but i loved the satisfying bonk of the of the, <laughs> of the big the, ass the hammer magic is basically the fist from replicant i don't like well. the fist i don't like the fist the fist is like it's too slow like doesn't work but no the, i don't know the, when devil and popola started using the fist that was my favorite one to punish because they would just punch past me and i would just hit him in the back mm -hmm. but yeah i just wanted to praise that this is the type of implementation implementation of an easy mode that i support because it gives you that same feeling in both playthroughs like the 
the enemies are the same. So you don't get this feeling of like, oh, I watched someone play this and they're playing, uh, they're fighting Fire Giant. And Fire Giant's really tanky and hard to kill, you know, and it's taken them a long time. But I played it on easy mode and it only took me 30 seconds because each hit did a, a 16th of his health and I only had to get hit him 16 times. You know, like there, there's a, a fundamental difference in that type of an easy mode versus how this one works out. And Final Fantasy 16 is the exact same way. I still have trauma from Fire Giant sitting on me. <laughs> I, I'm we'll in the minority of liking Fire where we, Giant. Where we can all uh, air our grievances about being flipped with a a lid over and over and over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I like the, the I like the I did like the customization abilities. I mean, I th- always thought it was really cool. To, How much of the HUD did you remove? I used to, I to removed make space a, for other. I removed a decent amount. I removed like numbers. Um, uh, fuck, well, we're, that's the only one that I can remember. But there was a couple more that I did. I kept a certain. I kept a decent amount in, but like towards the end, I did need. I did need some extra space. Need to make it, some space. It was all about making space for the auto pickup. It was for mm-hmm. the auto the auto pickup chip. Auto that pickup, was, baby. That was the big one. That How was many the big of you one. accidentally removed your OS chip? I did not. I almost sold mine. I almost (laughs) almost sold my OS. I was just flipping through it. I was like, I was sitting there. I was like, man, I wonder what like all these other chips do if I could just like make all this space. And I finally got to OS and removed it and I got the ending for it. And I was like, oh, (laughs) cool. Neat. There's one. So when you get that ending like that, where does it then bring you back? Just to your latest save? Last save. Yeah. It's not bad. The, the, so how we know most likely to be doing that in the camp yeah how, how, how we know that yoko taro is a beautiful genius is that uh when you are uh 2b to be when you self-destruct it blows your skirt off <laughs> that's my so favorite part of the game person so there's just, also the part of the game where the, if, the you try to, suit. if you try to pivot the camera under her skirt too many times she calls you out for it and you lose the ability to rotate your camera down you do get <laughs> you do get trophies for it as well um, yes. The same thing happens in in Replicant when you control Kaine, except she kicks you in the face. She kicks yeah. the cam- she kicks the camera in the face and like tells you to fuck off. I we mean, all know the more Vice co- calls her a hussy the whole time. So mm-hmm. we all know the cheat code in Autonoma is just to keep going up and down the stairs yeah. or like the, <laughs> the ladders. You don't get in trouble for that. You don't even have to change your camera angles. The natural angle is is beautiful. I do have to ask, how, how do the people who have significant others, how do you explain what you're doing when they walk in as you're climbing <laughs> up and down a ladder for the 15th time? <laughs> it's part of the mission. It's the story. I can't help it. A lot of backtracking. What can I say? I call it four. Not nearly as much as replicant. Oh my god. Yeah. So that's Thank that's god. a good that's a good thing. Can we talk about the fucking about his his uh, his feelings his on, for side quests. Yeah, his his feelings for side quests and why he hates them so much yet continues to include them. <laughs> he includes them. It be, let's just paint the full picture. He hates side quests. He thinks they're tedious and unnecessary, and they pad out games that don't need it. He puts them in there and makes them as tedious and unnecessary as possible because he knows people like me are going to do them because we need to check off the box that says hundred <laughs> percent on the quest page. We'd He's just to, trolling the absolute shit out of you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He was. He did it in Replicant the whole time. He like, was like the, hey, man, I need you to go to Seafront. Now I need you to go to Facade. Now I need you to go to back to the Airy. Now you need to go to uh, there's the, the there's Lost one, Shrine. Yeah. There's this one where like you talk, you're talking to a guard at the outside of the village. Um, you run to Seafront, talk to somebody. They then make you run back to the the same guard and then back to seafront and grimoire vice is like you gotta be fucking kidding me we were just there uh i that was some of the best stuff of the side quest was grimoire vice openly mocking he's like this is trivial and unnecessary to save the world what are we doing like well at least in automata you don't have to do that um whereas in order to progress like i've said in order to progress to certain endings in replicant you do need to engage with certain quests. There are because ending C only only unlocks if you've collected all weapons. There are three weapons that are tied to side quests that they're not; those are not difficult to to finish. But 
the majority of the weapons actually come, or at least like half, come through just purchasing from stores, and they cost a lot. Um, yes, and the only way to, the only way to get gold is to just complete these fucking tedious side quests. And that's the one where a little bit of game knowledge goes a long way because if you just wait till you get later side quests in the game that give you like fifty k gold for completing, instead of the shitty early side quests that give you like five hundred gold. And- and you're looking at the 30,000 gold weapon, you're like, oh my god, I'm going to have to do so many side quests to eventually afford that thing. Then you're always nervous about the... You're always nervous Spending about... Spending money like, on curatives. Well, and also, or also like, oh so my god, I'm, I'm, I'm going to progress the game too far and it's going to lock me out of the side quest that I need for the gold. Yeah. So I should just do it now. Oh my god, it sucks. I appreciate the trolling. I absolutely do. I always love me a good troll. <laughs> I mean, that's, um, that's why some of the trophies are fucking annoying, because he it's the same thing for him, where it's like he hates little checkboxes that people have to get rid of to make themselves feel complete, and so he makes his trophies hard to get so that people like me have to fucking hate ourselves while we're trying to complete near Replicant in 15 hours. Yeah, that that, that sounds no fun to me. Sick of shit. <laughs> you deserve that pain. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going for that one on this one in particular. It was kind of fun flipping through my PSN catalog and seeing the games that I had platinumed. And it's like the, the start of my PS4 cycle was just fucking banger after banger. It was like Horizon, Spider-Man, Ratchet and Clank, God of War, Bloodborne. Like These five, are all, those, five those platinums. Are all your platinums. Yeah. I've never five platinumed platinum the game ever. Never, nope. ever, never, never, ever done it. Probably. Yeah, I was flipping will. through your guys' pages to look at your trophy. I'm lists. always a solid. I'm always at a solid, like just over fifty percent. You're you're close to me, Andrew. You're only three hundred trophies behind me. <laughs> yeah, but are all what, of his what, what like two K? Are all of them two K? Just like every year of two K? Mostly. I mean, there, there was definitely some, a majority. There was some two K in there. There's definitely a lot of two K in there. That it's got to be seventy five percent. It's a lot of sports games. It's a lot of 2K, FIFA, MLB, Madden. Yeah. Just the, a yearly a yearly trophy Skyrim. cycle. Skyrim. Yeah. Skyrim, definitely. Elden Ring, got a lot of those. Elden Ring's probably the closest to platinuming any game I've ever been. Yeah. No, it was... Because I have 1,500, you have 1,200, and Ben is 800. Okay. I have zero because... No, you have, you have trophies opinion. through proxy from the ones that you got for Andrew. That's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's true. Yeah, at least some of those are yours. That's for sure. That's fair. So I'd like to wrap this up with one final question to the group where I just like to ask, you know, this is your chance to air your full feelings of what you've experienced. You know, did you enjoy what I put you through? Did you hate me for it? Did you grow self-loathing for what you were doing in these games? I certainly way. did at a certain let's, point. Let's see, I started that way for sure. I'm glad yeah. I didn't play Replicant. Yeah, you should be. Yes, I I would have hated Replicant. Yeah, definitely. See, it's would funny have hated to me because I I was thinking about it today in the shower, where all of my best thinking happens. Of course. Um, and I was trying to let, map it out because I was going to sit there and think like, where would I put these games on my like favorite games of all time list? You know, like what, what, like what broad sense could I say? And it's like Automata, I could probably put top ten without having to think too hard about that. Uh, but adding Replicant to it is like I was saying, like maybe top twenty-five, because I actually really enjoyed my time with Replicant. On like, <laughs> aside from the clunkiness, like I can look past are, some of that just because it's age. <laughs> I just I, I can accept the fact that some of its issues are just it's old. It's a 2010 game and they that's how they were built back then. They were tedious and annoying. I enjoyed Autonoma. Um I, I think it's one of the best like stories yes. I've played um ever, honestly. You know? Um I mean a lot of the games I played historically have been Templars versus uh, <laughs> assassins. So, and then just like me versus my rival in Pokemon. Um, so, like story wise, and the way Pokemon's definitely... adjusted, me versus my rival isn't really the fact anymore. Because like your rival yeah. is a friendly guy now. He's like, yeah, your yeah, rival's we're your best do friend. This together, Pokemon champions. 
Yeah. Instead of is, Gary, who was like, I fucked your mother last night. Uh, <laughs> Professor Oak is my We're, bitch. No, the best is uh the, the red haired guy in silver. Silver and gold. The guy that's just peeping through windows. But I mean, yeah, Gary so, was probably also peeping. I mean, fair. But yeah, so I, I would definitely put this as like, you know, very high up there in my story wise. I think it was an incredibly interesting story. Um and, and you know, wasn't a basic, you know, good guys versus bad guys. Oh no. There is no distinction there by the end of it. Yeah. Nope. And like one of the bad, you know, what would be like a traditional bad guy or you think is the antagonist was like one of my favorite characters. His his Eve? like cuts yeah, cutscene dialogue for Eve was fucking fantastic. The, one of the scenes where he's sitting at the table with, with his brother and yeah. they're like flipping through the books. He just wants to like play with his. Those... Bro- he just wants to play with his brother. He just wants yeah. to play with his elder I, brother. I love how you excited he gets. My brother. When he gets so excited, when his brother's like, "If you if you get through your stuff, we could play." And he's like, "It makes me want to get through it quicker." If you eat your if you eat your apple, you can. Uh, I'm gonna eat a hundred apples. Yeah. No, that's, it's just that's, a fantastic that's, that's character that, and voice that's something that also that comes that you know was again something that you that uh, comes from say replicant right is the humanizing of your villains yeah granted you don't get that you don't really get you get a little bit of that with the shadow lord because you still don't really understand the shadow lord um i mean you can at the end but get it's like it he's, ending b yeah he's 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 you know trying to save his sister you know that's that's he, just he, like you are he doesn't really he is care a mirror of yourself yeah he really doesn't care about humanity either he just cares about saving his sister well and uh, you know to humanizing your enemy i i think they execute this well um because th- you know this is something that has been in uh media lately has been a, a general theme of like humanizing the villain like just in in whether it's you know uh movies tv whatever marvel does it all the time it has been marvelized but it's like a very kind of well, just... i mean the marvelized version is the literal like you, your villain is a mirror of yourself like you're looking yeah, to what like, your own flaws could have made we're trying to make like loki like you know of uh you know humanize the villain there trying to make him yeah, like and turn them all into anti-heroes can't have actual bad people exactly it's, i mean even you know, venom's it's... an anti-hero now it's just very in your face and you know uh there's a lot of like um you know telling and not like showing you what's going on there's no development there so i think that autonoma does a very good job of of you know uh, one because they're kind of uh dissolving the distinction between you know a good guy and bad guy they're able to do that um and make it meaningful and you know actually uh, execute it well rather than just making you know uh throwing like niche or not niche uh cliche tropes in there uh to show that you're humanizing well it's part of the like we covered it already a bit with the the philosophers discussion but it's like he's not just putting them in there as a like a point at the screen like ooh, i get that reference like it's no so many people there's, probably did. There is a purpose. Yeah. There is a purpose that they all serve. No, nothing is that flat. Yeah. Andrew, you want to go next? Sorry, what was that? What was the question? So do you want to go next? Your your final thoughts, ratings? Oh yeah. Just in general. Um I yeah, I, I love this story. I think it's a fantastic narrative. Um I have some minor critiques about just the overall game design. There are some things that frustrated me, but uh, from a anything, narrative perspective, is there anything in particular from mechanic wise? Because I am all, I am always interested in that as well. For me, just the um, I think the combat's tight. I I get frustrated with the how you interact with the world, which I think is more of a limitation than anything else. But like, there's just areas where it feels like you should be able to run through this corridor or jump over something and you just run into a, uh, invisible, a invisible wall, wall yeah. and that just got frustrating at points to me that that's probably my largest critique um 
yeah it's not it's not a full full open world everything is accessible like yeah, like a Tears of the that, Kingdom though. Breath of the Wild or I don't have an issue with it it's just like there's a pl- there's places where it's like you can see where you want to go and it looks like you should just be able to go through it and it's just invisible um the other it's much I, more egregious and replicant let me tell you i was that, complaining that truly my, yeah like, that first... truly is a technical thing yeah and replicant definitely and then uh the world is, is so and... smaller so much smaller there too it just feels so yeah. claustrophobic and i do i don't know i think combat while i like it i could i could use with slightly i think i probably could have gone up a difficulty level honestly is really what i could have done um I mean the the dodge mechanic is very gracious in this yeah. game. Yeah, like I didn't have to do any sort of real thought around leveling things up or making sure I was at the right point from a skill perspective to take on any of the bosses. But um, like I said, the the narrative of this game is really above and beyond. That should be another good question to ask everyone before we wrap it in co- in its entirety. What was your favorite weapon choice? Doesn't have to be an exact name, just a weapon class. I went. I I ended up uh, going starting weapons. I I got them all up to for for Tomina. The, starting, uh, starting. Like, did you go pick up the weapons you dropped when you yes. died? I mean, you only dropped the big one. You only dropped the big yes. one. But yeah, those the virtuous contract or whatever, and those two, the white swords. One because they look the flashiest. Um. And I upgraded both of those to their highest level and stuck with them. I love those. I love those weapons. I did not like the spears as much. And that was mainly because the spears were so good in, in Replicant. This is where you and I, I didn't play Replicant, but uh, I really that's liked pe- the spears. That's purely why I didn't like the spear. Yeah, it was just I mean, in Replicant, Replicant. The, the, the thing with spears is you just hold down square and you spin to win. And it just he does a really good pop, 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 pop. Yeah, the, the spear had, had a the, cool combo, which I liked. I had like the beast uh beast blade. The, yeah, like the buster beast pain. Sport. Yeah. Uh that I leveled up all the way. Um I enjoyed that one. And then I found uh bracers, like these yeah, fists. Those were pretty cool. Yeah, they were like these huge fist things. Um that I really enjoyed, especially those were good with nine S, um, because you didn't have the the two weapons yeah. or like the heavy attack. They had a good, uh, you could like hold it down and you could like throw them at the enemy. Yeah, I did not like See, the nine, where the I nine S combat weird. as much because of the lack of the heavy attack. Yeah, that I used the engine blade. Interesting. The, the Final Fantasy 15 tie-in weapon. I'm Googling that now to see what it looks like. Yep. Yeah. Did you have to like run somewhere at the you know beginning of the game to find it or some shit? It's it's pretty it's a, if I remember correctly, it's pretty well hidden. But once I picked it up, I leveled it up to max and used that exclusively to end the game. I just feel like I just feel like the opening weapons just look so much cooler. Oh, they, I, they. I mean, they're I love clearly the designed to. Yeah. What's the 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 heavy, offset katana look? What's the heavy opening weapon? I don't remember if that one's a, a virtuous contract or not. No, that one's the light. The that's the katana. This one's just a big katana. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember if I picked up the heavy one. Yeah, you have to go back to the location of your self destruction. Yeah, it's by the factory. Um, yeah, but so back. so my final thoughts though. Um, I really, uh, really did not like um, Replicant. I've made that. I've expressed that pretty clearly. Um, I found I found most of the characters to be, uh, you know, either just kind of. Uh, big kind of very flat or very grating one of two ways the only character it's weird I... too because the characters were that way but there were some subtleties like we never even really brought up the music at all uh in discussion right. we're starting to really run over so i'm going to try to wrap us rather soon 
uh, but like in Replicant, you get this thing where you enter village and you get the very faint guitar music, very light in the background. And as you get closer to the heart of the village, the guitar music picks up in its intensity and you get more complexity to the melody. And then you open the tavern door and you get devil is singing added to it. Yeah. And it's just like this uh, way of adding a little bit of immersion to the background music, yeah. which so is probably one of my favorite parts of these. There's, games. there were some really good twists in, in, uh, in replicant that were cool the devil and popola turn was was cool the getting the different perspective on the shades was interesting but like again i just like i couldn't see myself through all five endings it was just too tedious um but um automata really uh it kind of ran the gamut for me um that although never into bad territory it, it started off I was wary going into it because of my generally negative opinions on Replicant. Um, I was a little kind of nervous going into it. I was like, oh my God, am I going to have to spend another like 20, 30 hours, you know, through a slog? And so I started off maybe a little ambivalent, a little, a little suspicious. And I was like not feeling a huge connect with the story and the characters. But like with each successive ending, it really was hitting harder each time. And it was so the different ending mechanic was so much better executed than it was in Replicant. You are truly getting new gameplay. You're getting a, not just not just perspective switches, but of the same game. It's it is truly a different experience each time. But it was like getting ending E was just a sublime experience as i've kind of already explained like of where it all just kind of hit home for me was just it was getting that message from some random person um and then and then being able to do the same for somebody else it was it was and it's like a, it's you know you're you're a little fucking you're a little fucking triangle shooting at 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 glowing balls at the from the credits from the credit scene you know it's like you're you're not even doing it but it's just, it's so simple but like it just it retroactively made me appreciate every everything else that i had experienced up until that point to when at then the end when the pods bring back 2b 9s and a2 i you know it's just like you know i had you know say was fully in love with the characters with the story with the world with the message that he was trying to get that like it even made me appreciate Replicant more um, coming from it to see where it kind of had its, the, these ideas had their genesis made me appreciate them more. Um, but, you know, Automata is a, is an easy 10 out of 10 for me. Like we were talking about like mechanic quibbles and stuff. The only one that I had was the difficulty of using healing items. Um Granted, it say it was it was in one way better than replicant, and whereas Repl it's the same button you hit down on the D-pad, whereas in replicant it pauses the gameplay, so you can choose which item you're going to use. Like you could say, yeah, that breaks up the flow of combat, and whereas yeah. the other one is is still done in real time, you're still playing around. But like I would try to like hit the to get to the one that I want to use, and it would either the input I would either do the inputs too fast or too slow and i would either use the wrong uh the wrong thing or it would just go away and i'd have to do it again um uh so that was like my select. one that was like my one little uh yeah you could you could do it but like uh, i don't know it's just like it felt it's still cleaner to, to, yeah. to do that one so it was just that was my one little mechanical quibble um rather than having to go through a menu rather than having to really go through menus to find to get to my item page um but uh, that that's it that's like the only mechanical issue i had um and then even that was fine because by the end i had so many fucking healing items like it didn't matter which one i used um and those machine cores baby selling those oh, yeah. getting about 20k yeah because they go up and they go up in worth in each su subsequent playthrough yeah. um but uh yeah i uh the aesthetic was was really interesting the world seemed so much more better realized in Automata. Um, I don't know. I just like I can't. I can't sing the praises enough of of Automata. Um, one thing I wanted to I wanted to mention 
um, even though I'm pretty sure it's like canon confirmed because I've heard Yoko Taro himself refer to it as near automata, it's it'll always be <laughs> it'll it'll always be near automata for me. Yeah, yeah. Near automata pia. Yeah. <laughs> Here's your last fun fact before we do the the sign off. To be or not to be. That's the fun joke there. <laughs> a2 is the one that I didn't know at the time. It was a play on et tu brutus. Mm-hmm. Okay. As Caesar is dying. No, I'm I'm enjoying it so much that I've even done a and we'll have to resubscribe to Crunchyroll to watch, watch the to anime. Fi- finish watching the anime. Yeah, I'm interested to check that out personally. I didn't know there was an anime. Just wait till yeah, it's wait till the, pretty good. Wait till the final episodes of the season come out, and then just do the free Get trial. A week, a week free of Crunchyroll. Yeah, just do the free trial. Um, which I'm going to do with a different email uh, when the when the next ones come out, because I have like three emails, so I can I've, I've got a I've got a, a bit that I can do. But Matt, thank you. I would say thank you for making yeah. us play these. I I had had them yeah. in my library for a yeah. while, but I don't know if I would. have. My, my goal was to make you guys them. play something that you wouldn't normally play that I'd think you'd like. And I was gonna do Astral Chain originally, but I figured against that a because this is a little easier for people to get their hands on because it's on every platform, whereas Astral Chain is just a Switch game, which uh, I do I do own and it is on my. Uh, is on my list and it's one that we should potentially cover because you're playing as fucking like space cops to- basically to- tokyo cops mm-hmm. tokyo, to- cyberpunk cops. tokyo cyberpunk co- cyber cops yeah with, with with your chain demon friend <laughs> oh um, yeah you nailed it you nailed this one i i was very um my overall enjoyment with this game was way more than i anticipated it being i mean this is one of the few games that has genuinely made me cry yeah, the storyline's incredible. No, it's that again, it's just for me, is that bit at the end. And he, like, I mean, I, I had like come to really care for these characters and was like, you know, you know, distraught at their various endings. But like, it was just that bit in E, and it's again, it's the way the music incorporates it into, but it's just like the how it really was just hit home for me. It was well, like, I'd said it uh, after watching that YouTube video as a refresher uh, when he starts to make his discussion about ending E. It was like all of the feelings I got from playing my first run through, like all really started to come back to me. And it was just kind of one of those that you don't really get that a lot with games. It was like, I can think back to like breath of the wild. I really enjoyed that experience. And that was like something very unique for me at the time, but it didn't make me feel in the same way that automata did on its um, like time on my time with it. If that makes sense, so so much more emotionally uh, relevant. You know what? You know what's great is I'm thinking about right now. It's like we're going through such the emotional endeavor of playing. Now we're going to be doing game, sports games, and then we're going to do the yeah, actually em- emotional, no black, emotional black hole of, of sports <laughs> yeah. games. Yeah, oh, you no, bring I'm your, gonna, you bring your own Call of Duty. <laughs> no, because I mean, all jokes, be all jokes aside, there is some interesting parts to that discussion that I'm looking forward to. For, oh yeah, for, for next month. I, I'm interested in talking about the devolution of sports games and how they used to be so much better. Yeah. Yes. Um. All right. So, Matt, thank you again for leading us through this episode. Yeah, this was a good one. A little schedule, long, but we 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 work with it. Yeah, our schedule should probably will you know get back to normal. We have to mix things up a little bit for this one, but I believe next episode is next Halo. Say, it's next week we're doing the Halo series I'm I'm down to like the last two episodes I think to watch um, isn't about to be me watching like four or five episodes in the next two days Same. I'm gonna be watching most wanna, of those on the plane run one of a watch party <laughs> that's, not, man. that's not bad that's not people bad. on the plane are gonna be looking at you like oh my god he's emotionally abused someone should tell him <laughs> <laughs> All right, but till then, uh, you can check us out on twitch.tv slash campaign comrades or over on our YouTube channel, just campaign comrades on YouTube. Um, and remember, listeners, glory to comrades. <laughs> right, bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.